Welcome to The Real News Network, live on Facebook and YouTube and I think Periscope and therealnews.com. Uh, we're going to continue our conversation we've been having on The Real News about the fight within the Democratic Party, uh, Donna Brazile's uh, revelations, and uh, as we go, a, a bit of a series that's going to unfold here uh, with our guest, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, about just what is the uh, prescription, one could say, for reform of the Democratic Party, if that's possible. And we're going to discuss whether or not it's worth the effort, and if so, what uh, that might look like. Uh, but we're going to start with Donna Brazile. And uh, in Donna Brazile's book, which I'm sure just about everybody who's watching this has heard about, if not already read, uh, one of the more explosive things she exposed was a sort of financial shenanigan that the Clinton campaign had used uh, to give, uh, to up the amount of money any individual could donate by giving a certain amount of money, uh, a few thousand dollars, uh, to every state party, uh, which in theory is supposed to be used for state funding of uh, local elections, but instead 99%, apparently, according to Donna Brazil, of that, that money actually went back to uh, the coffers of the of the uh, cam Hillary campaign back to the DNC, and then the Hillary campaign controlled that that money. Uh, to quote Donna Brazil, she says, uh, "The states kept less than half of one percent of the 82 million they had amassed from the extravagant fundraisers Hillary the Hillary's campaign was holding." Uh, it's interesting that if you actually do the math, because uh, they accused. Bernie Sanders of not raising hardly any money for the uh, state campaigns. Uh, if you do the math, something like $850,000 or so actually stayed in the state campaigns once all this money gets transferred back to the control of the Hillary campaign. Uh, and Sanders raised $5 million for down ticket Democrats. So he actually wound up raising more uh, for down ticket uh, ballots than uh, the Hillary campaign. Uh, at any rate, the revelations of Donna Brazile, which essentially amount to her accusing the DNC of rigging the uh, primary, the Sanders-Clinton primary, and when Elizabeth Warren was asked directly, did you think it was rigged, she said yes. Well, it's, it sparked a great deal of controversy, as you know. Uh, for example, uh, this is what uh, happened on CNN. Uh, we're going to run the Hillary Rosen clip. For Democrats to spend a second relitigating this primary fight could not be, you know, stupider. If, if we're going to take Donna at her word, then you have to read the whole excerpt. Because what the excerpt said is Hillary Clinton bailed out the DNC financially and controlled the staffing of the DNC. But Donna also said in that excerpt, Nina and Don, that she went door to door at the DNC and could not find a single shred of evidence that the actual results of the primary were tilted one way or another. And so if we're going to comment on the book, we ought, uh, we ought to go all the way and say that actually Donna said that she found no proof and no evidence at all that the system was rigged. Since you want to go there, this is really about a DNC that lacks accountability and transparency, period. Yes, and we maybe, can deal with more than one thing at a time. That's not we about have rigging restore, an election. Let's we have to restore that. the faith and credibility of the Democratic Party and statements like you're mm -hmm. making doesn't help. All right, let me introduce our guest, Norman Solomon. Norman is the co-founder of RootsAction.org, and he's co-author of a new report, Autopsy, the Democratic Party in Crisis. Thanks for joining us, Norman. Thanks, Paul. So uh, there's kind of two arguments there. One, let's start with the first, that now's not the time to rehash all of this, that, that, that Trump represents a kind of, uh, they are not using this language, but I will, a kind of neo-fascism. Uh, there's a broad front called the resistance, and people like Hillary Rosen and others uh, are saying that this isn't a time to, they use their word, relitigate uh, what the DNC did or didn't do. There should just be a, a constructive outlook in terms of reforming the DNC. Don't rehash who did what to whom and focus on attacking Trump. Uh, how do you respond to that? Well, you know, ideally there's a united front against the horrific uh, Trump uh, presidency there's not usefulness in being united behind bad strategies and undemocratic internal processes of the Democratic Party. After all, 
Democrats the first name of the party. And when we see so clearly that contempt for basic democratic principles uh, were in play and in force inside the Democratic National Committee, then it doesn't work to just shrug and say, well, that's the past, so let's move on. The reality is that the same basic forces, the political corporate tendencies and power uh, that held the DNC last year still control it this year. Uh, so it's all well and good to say, hey, just move on. But we can't move on without being real about what happened and what continues to be in play in terms of the top down power at the DNC. The uh, media has, on the whole, been very antagonistic to Donna Brazile, well, at least the media I've seen, uh, led, of course, by MSNBC and I've seen CNN, especially in the first few days after Brazil's uh, book was started to be released by the Washington Post. Uh, there was one report I saw was a CNN journalist who just lambasted Brazil. We couldn't find the clip, uh, but she, NBC had released this uh, uh, agreement between the Clinton campaign and the DNC, and according to a uh, couple of sentences in that agreement, uh, this, the money that Clinton was controlling and the power she had over the DNC was all supposed to be directed towards the general election, which uh, would have been appropriate. Um, but, but NBC later actually, uh, it got revealed when people look at the dates, and I, I understand NBC even had to retract this. Um, that the uh, dates actually showed it was clearly about the primary, and, and, and Donna Brazile clearly makes that this control of, of Clinton uh, was all about the primary. Um, but, but the attack continued. Here's, here's Robbie Mook, a former campaign manager for Clinton on CNN. You know, politics is politics. People have to go there, you know, go out there and say what they need to say. I think it is, I think it's dangerous to say that this contest was rigged. We can't make the case to working people in this country that we're going to be, that we're going to stand up for them and we're going to fight for them if we're fighting each other. We can't do that. Hillary Clinton won this primary but with almost four million votes. That's a bigger lead than Barack Obama had over her when she lost and conceded uh, in 2008. The idea that the DNC could rig a contest, frankly, is laughable. And here's the last thing I'll say. You know, the caucus contests in, w within the larger primary are the contests that are run by the party. You know, the, the, the primary elections are run by secretaries of state. Those contests, the caucuses that were run by the party, Bernie Sanders won overwhelmingly. So if we look at what the party actually managed in this process, Bernie Sanders won those contests. I think we only won three of them, and we barely won Iowa. So, so there's just no evidence to back this up. So, Norman, what do you make of that point? The, the caucuses were controlled by the party, Bernie won the majority, and the DNC didn't control the elections in the state. So how can you uh, accuse the Clinton campaign and the DNC of rigging the uh, primaries? Uh, a significant side note, a footnote, is that the Iowa caucuses, pivotal at the very start of the uh, season, were run in an extremely shabby and questionable way by the party. So if I were Robbie Mook, I wouldn't boast about uh, how the caucuses were run by the party. But more fundamentally, you know, getting hung well, up... Hang on, on for a sec, Norman. What, what do you mean by run in a shabbily way? Oh, the count of the votes uh, during the Iowa caucus night uh, were, you know, you wouldn't accept at a student council race. Uh, it was uh, funky, to say the least, problematic. Uh, there seemed to be thumbs on the scales in terms of just counting up in the caucus rooms who had won, and it's very dubious whether Hillary Clinton actually won the Iowa caucuses, even though officially she did. Fundamentally, whether we get caught up in the word rigged or not, the reality is, and we knew this uh, a way before Donna Brazile's book, the reality is uh, that there was a tilted playing field. It was not a level playing field. The DNC was tilted for Hillary Clinton from 2015 on, and the reality is, as we know now from the Brazil book, that the Clinton campaign at the outset of the primary season had control over and veto power over who was hired in basic positions such as communications director at the DNC. So, you know, people can try to clean up the mess like Robbie Mook, the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton, but the reality is it was wrong. It was wrong how the DNC operated. It was not even handed. It was a violation of the DNC's own charter, which commits theoretically the party and the DNC to being even handed throughout 
the nomination selection process for president. So there's a big problem. And unless the people at the top of the DNC acknowledge the problem, then we're uh, fated and uh, required, really, uh, to keep fighting this battle. Uh, and, and the battle includes not just the battle against Hillary Clinton, but, according, but people involved in this progressive wing, as people are calling it, of the Democratic Party, were also many of them dealing with uh, the policies of uh, Barack Obama. And, and in Donna Brazile's book, one of the interesting revelations was the extent to which the DNC, the party itself, was millions and millions of dollars in debt. And we know during the Obama years, uh, uh, many, a majority, I think, of state legislatures were taken over by the Republicans. At many levels, the, the party was kind of being demolished across the country. And it's interesting on CNN, at the same time that uh, uh, Mook was, I'm sorry, when Hillary Rosen was on, uh, there was a Republican, a former advisor to Bush, uh, Scott Jennings, and he actually makes an interesting point about Obama's role. Let's roll that. It is amazing to me what no one's pointing out, that the president of the United States at the time, Barack Obama, had left his Democrat National Committee in such a shambles that not only was Hillary Clinton having to fight off Bernie Sanders, but she knew that if she were to get the nomination, she had to simultaneously bail out the DNC so it could be a viable entity for the general election. And this really, to me, falls at the feet of Barack Obama, whose path of destruction through the Democratic Party for eight years is completed by these Brazil revelations. Now, I know that the, the right-wing uh, use of Brazil uh, is certainly not meant to kind of strengthen any progressive fight uh, anywhere, and particularly not in the Democratic Party. But it seems to me what, this, what Jennings is saying has a lot, a lot to it. And, and when you look at Barack Obama's policies that led to such growth in uh, inequality across the country, uh, you know, we know the numbers of the, was it something like 90 percent of the post-0708 crisis crash uh, income uh, gains went to less than 1 percent of the population. Uh, that, plus the destruction of the infrastructure of the Democratic Party, all helped create the conditions for the election of Trump. But uh, is it this, certainly this needs to be part of the diagnosis, too, doesn't it? The, these are points that were uh, elaborated on in great detail in the report released three days before the first excerpts from Donna Brazil's book came out, and that is the task force-driven report called Autopsy, the Democratic Party in Crisis, which I co-coordinated with Karen Bernal, the chair of the California Democratic Party uh, Progressive Caucus. And everybody is invited, by the way, to go to the web, read that report, that autopsy report, at the website democraticautopsy.org. And one of the points that we emphasize throughout uh, the autopsy is that in eight years of the Obama administration, uh, the president's affinity with uh, support for and from Wall Street uh, cut the legs out from under the traditional working class support for the Democratic Party. And the money problem that the DNC uh, fell into with the neglect from President Obama was in its own right a huge problem and also a marker and a tracker uh, for the way in which the Obama presidency helped to get Obama obviously reelected, but was devastating for uh, down ballot Democrats. When you have during the eight years of the Obama administration a loss of more than 1,000 state legislative seats, a uh, loss of Democrats to Republicans around the country, when you lose the Senate and you lose the House on Capitol Hill, and somehow the president comes up high and dry and keeps hobnobbing with and uh, stocking his cabinet with all these uh, corporate uh, uh, flax and, in some cases, billionaires like Penny Pritzker, Secretary of Commerce, who helped to bankroll Obama's political career in the first place, then it is a fundamental problem about the Democratic Party at the top. And there are really no indications that the governing body of the National Party, the DNC, has come to terms with that reality in any way other than continuing it. So this is what the battle is really about as we come to the last weeks of 2017 when we look to the uh, elections coming up in 2018 and beyond is the struggle for the Democratic Party. Will it be the party of Main Street or Wall Street? 
And the claim, and incidentally, Donna Brazil is a longtime Clinton loyalist, but you know, she's willing to look out for herself now and sell the books and so forth. But the reality is that the power structure at the DNC that Donna Brazil uh, has always been part of and that the current chair, uh, Tom Perez, is very much part of, that power structure is all about serving the donor class, the big donors, those who can provide six-figure checks with the flick of a hand uh, in the checkbook. And the pretense, the fallacy, uh, and the betrayal, really, of working-class people, of young people, of people of color, uh, from the hierarchy of the Democratic Party is the claim that somehow we're going to be getting along with Wall Street and we're going to help Main Street. And we saw, and you alluded to the transfer of wealth further upward, Paul, uh, during the Obama administration. This is an absolute falsehood. And this is, in reality, a division of labor that is being uh, called for and enforced uh, by those in power of the Democratic Party that effectively they look at working class people as those who are supposed to come up with a requisite number of votes uh, during an election, but it's the people who are at the top uh, donor strata, uh, Wall Street, the big corporations, those who serve and represent and uh, are at the top of the big banks, they are the ones uh, who are the masters largely of National Democratic Party policy, not entirely, but largely. And so when it comes down to deference to messaging uh, and messaging uh, priorities in terms of who gets the money of these Democratic Party campaigns, the emphasis is on shifting the party more and more in a corporate direction. That's why in our report, Autopsy, the Democratic Party in Crisis, we focus on how so much money in 2016, and still, even in Virginia, so much money from the Democratic Party goes to messaging supposedly persuadable, so-called moderate Republican voters. And it's a way of saying to people of color, young people, working class people generally, we want your votes, but our policies and our outreach and our messaging will set you aside as being secondary. Um, I, I think it's particularly interesting, Donna Brazile's uh, critique, even attack on uh, Obama. I mean, during the Obama years, she was uh, number one cheerleader on CNN for the policies of Barack Obama. Um, but she called uh, him, Obama and Clinton, she talked about dealing with these two enormous egos. And a, a lot of people have critiqued uh, Obama for continuing, really, the Bush-Cheney imperial presidency, the idea that the presidency is above the law, above everything else. And in Obama's case, certainly above the party. And the idea of a real party with party structure, in theory, introduces a certain kind of democratic process. Uh, and, and Obama had no interest in that after he had this campaign, President, his first campaign particularly, but second, which was all about online and mass movement and house parties and small donors. Uh, all that went by the wayside once, once he was president. And, and I guess part of what Sanders did is he kind of reignited a fight within the party to actually build some party structure. Uh, and now we see from Brazil's book, uh, you know, in spite of and against the DNC, which supposedly is supposed to be there to defend party structures. I think that's right. And I want to recommend to people the cover story in the current issue of The Nation magazine by William Greider, who's been covering the Democratic Party for several decades. And in this piece in The Nation uh, titled, uh, What Killed the Democratic Party, uh, he summarizes our autopsy report and quite correctly characterizes it as a call for rebellion and for working people, for young people, people of color, to gain control over the party that in theory represents them and in fact largely does not. And Greider, I think, uh, you know, quite uh, astutely uh, sums up that we have this challenge now uh, to organize effectively, to point out what the Democratic Party really is, not what it claims to be, and to see that there's an opportunity here. Uh, we're, we're down in the hole. We do not have a uh, lever to pull that can move the Democratic Party in a progressive direction, and yet there's tremendous organizing going on. And as you referred to, Paul, I think Bernie Sanders did reignite a struggle that has to take place. 
because as we say at the very outset of the autopsy report, we have two huge responsibilities in this historic period. One is to fight the right, the racist, the xenophobes, the misogynists, uh, the repressive forces that according to, and I think he's correct, Noam Chomsky, the Republican Party now is the most dangerous organization in the history of the world. We've got to fight back against the Trump regime and against the Republican control of Congress. And the second responsibility is to move forward a truly progressive agenda that will come from the grassroots, have staying power, and move not only the Democratic Party, but the country in a genuine progressive direction. And the mythology, and we have so many liberals and people like at the clip, Robbie Mook and Hillary Rosen and others, people at Mother Jones piling on, some uh, traditional liberals or some who claim to be progressives. And I remind people, uh, there's an insurance company claims to be progressive. It doesn't mean uh, much of anything, the label. There's an effort to tell people, chill out, calm down, uh, only concentrate on defeating the right-wing Republicans, don't advance a progressive agenda, and there's a claim, explicit or otherwise, that actually those two goals are in contradiction. You know, either you push a progressive agenda or you fight the right. In fact, the opposite is true. And I think the autopsy documents that very clearly.